Now we have two parents who are doctors yeah. and every single evening at the dinner table, they're talking about death. And I mean like every evening, you know, we're passing the meatloaf and they're talking about these diseases, you know, and my sister and I are horrified because like, oh my God, I have this little bump on my arm. I'm dying, you know, because everyone they talk about is dying, death, you know. Today we're joined by Ken Ross. Ken is an independent commercial photographer who specializes in travel, people and corporate photography. Ken is also the son of psychiatrist and author Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and he serves as president of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation. Of course Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is very relevant to this show as she was the world's foremost expert on death and grief and brought death and grief to the cultural forefront. In this episode with Ken, we talk about his parents making death a dinner table topic, how exposure to meeting people close to dying at a young age encouraged him to live for today, and how his mother taught him how to live a love-based life rather than a fear-based life. Ken also discusses with us about why people are more afraid to die today because they are less exposed to death than we used to be, and he elaborates more on his mother's work on the five stages of dying. Please support the show by liking and sharing this episode on social media. And to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes, sign up for our newsletter at deathhangout.com. It would also be a massive help to us if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, which you can do right now by simply clicking the subscribe button. Now, get ready for this episode, Dining with Death. How was it to, to be a kid and have Elizabeth Kubler-Ross as a, as, a, as a mother, you know, how is it for you to be raised in this, in this family? Well, it was very interesting because, you know, for the first nine years of my life, my mother was kind of a regular mother, a Swiss hillbilly, if you will. And then uh, in 1969, she wrote her first book. And of course, the phone started ringing, mail started coming in, people started showing up at our door, first a few, and then more and more. And then people were literally lined up and sitting in our study and sitting in our living room and it was, it was quite amazing to watch. I mean, it was just this exponential curve of attention, bags of mail coming in. My mother started traveling. Then I didn't get to see my mother much because she was on the road and her calendar went out three years, if you can imagine. Wow. So I would just go down her calendar and I'd say, okay, well, I want to go to Egypt for New Year's and then I want to go to Brazil for Easter. And then the summer I want to go to the Aleutian Islands. And, you know, it was like a big adventure, a big game. Wow. Uh, so it's really fascinating, and, and people would kind of spoil my mother, and we get to do these amazing adventures, like uh, Mrs. Sadat in Egypt yeah, offered us to stay in the pyramids during the night, you know, wow. and, and all sorts of amazing things that, you know, normal kids don't get to do, you know, when they're teenagers. So it was bad in that I didn't see my mother much, but when I got to see her, amazing quality of time, and I got to see this, you know, beautiful work she did around the world. We got to, you know, meet very interesting people, and have adventures that you know were, were quite fascinating and impressive for a child D did you understood what was it all about really because you were you know it, it was really about death and dying w was she like talking mm -hmm. to you about that was it like was it like something as a surprise that came as a surprise for you well you know on one hand you know you have two parents who are doctors yeah. and every single evening at the dinner table they're talking about death and i mean like every evening you know we're passing the meatloaf and they're talking about these diseases, you know, and my sister and I are horrified because like, oh my God, I have this little bump on my arm. I'm dying, you know, because everyone they talk about is dying, death, you know, cancer, this brain tumor. It was pretty shocking as a child. So we were very kind of neurotic about our health, but at the same time we got exposed and, and that was kind of interesting. I met people when I was eight years old, 10 years old, 12, who were, you know, my age, and they were dying. They'd have six weeks to live. And they say, you know, Ken, go out and live your dream life because, you know, I'm your age and I'm dying. You, you just don't know how long you have in this life. And so they say, go out and have that second chocolate sundae and like never worry about tomorrow or yesterday. Just live for today. Wow. You know, so really, after you start meeting a couple hundred dying people when you're young, it makes an impression. That was going to be my question. One of my questions as well is, is 
that's that's a lot of death to be around at that age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of... It was it was kind of frightening in some ways, but it also kind of inspired me to like always think about life and appreciate everything I have every day and don't assume that tomorrow's going to be the same. What is, what does that look like on a day to day basis in terms of how you go about making your decisions or or what you decide to do or not do or who who you decide to keep in your life and who you don't? <laughs> All those right. kind of questions. You know, so my mother said, always live your life love-based and not fear-based, right? So, okay. you know, as a kid, as a teenager, you have a lot of fears, right? I was very quiet and very shy, and I thought, okay, well, you know, this is something I want to work on because I want to interact with the world around me, but I'm shy. My mother's lesson is that go out and challenge your fears. So I really, really worked hard to go out and challenge my fears, and it was really very difficult. It took a while, a while, a while. And now I give public speeches. And when I was a kid, I could never imagine speaking in public would be the most horrifying thing you know you could ever do. And now I have no trouble speaking to five, six hundred people is you know no big deal. So it's nice, like when you can free yourself of these fears, because then you can live your life more fully. I studied banking, but I decided I really didn't want to be a banker, even though I was half Swiss. I decided <laughs> I wanted to be a photographer because my dad had these national geographics, and I thought if life is short and very precarious. You know, I want to go out and live the most fun life possible. And I thought, what will be the most fun life you could ever live? And I thought, oh, these National Geographic photographers have this dream life. They go out and they see these cultures. You know, they get to meet indigenous people, go to mountaintops, hang out of helicopters. And I go, that sounds like an extraordinary way to spend your life. So my goal when I was young was to photograph 101 countries. And I've now been to 95. It's not just the number. It's the adventures yeah. that I've gone yeah. with. You know, hitchhiking in Zimbabwe and climbing in the Alps and rafting the Zambezi and nightclub in Beirut. You know, that's like a life that people dream of. And so I have tried to do that. I find it fascinating because I think there's especially um, there's all this stuff about uh, children should left to be children and don't expose them to too much. And they have plenty of time for this. And then there's another school of thought, which is the sooner they get used to it. Just, what would your view be on that? Just Obviously, I'm biased because I had, you know, so that, that woman is my mother. So her theory was that people are afraid to die because in Western society at this time of history, people are not exposed to death the way they used to. You know, right. people in the old days, you'd see death. It's, you know, you'd see your grandmother dying in the house and it would be a part of your life. And the thing is, we fear what we don't understand and we don't have any experience with. So she said, the younger you can expose people, you know, and gently, don't like slam it in their face, but, you know, <laughs> gently expose people to the idea that life is finite. Oh, you'll be a much healthier adult because it'll be a part of your experience, you know, because in society today, dying people are locked up in old age homes because we just don't want to deal with the idea of growing older and fading away. It's locked away. We don't see it. And that makes society very unhealthy, in her opinion. Mm -hmm. Gently introduce the idea. And again, you know, everyone's going to be different. Some people will not be able to handle it. She thinks the vast majority of people will benefit from having this early exposure to dying people. And she wanted to build these Elizabeth houses where she'd take an old age home and combine it with a child care center so that the old people, you know, will have this joy of being with children and that the children will see that, hey, people get older, you know, people die and it'll be a part of their early experience and it'll make them, you know, much healthier adults. You said, you said your, your mother thought that was unhealthy. Unhealthy in what way? Uh, anything we're not exposed to typically can make us fear it. So people who don't travel, they're afraid of other cultures. And same with death. If you're not exposed to it, you, you fear what you don't understand and haven't experienced. You mentioned the book, Elizabeth's book. I believe there's a big anniversary coming next year. I believe it's the 50th anniversary of the book on death and dying. Exactly. Exactly. All. Exactly. So can you, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about, about this book, about this work? What is cooking for next year, basically, to celebrate this book? What's cooking in the kitchen? Let me take a look in the pot here. <laughs> well, we're very excited because uh, I just became the president of the foundation again. Uh, Diane Gray was president for six years and did a wonderful job. When I was president, when I started the foundation 12 years ago, you know, it was me and a secretary. So I was president of a secretary. So now we have this amazing board. I'm trying to make my mark as president again. And so we have On Death and Dying, this you know, famous book on thanatology, on the dying that you know, helped begin the conversation. A lot of people like to kind of attack the stages and attack the book and her work. The fact is that 
the book has been out for 50 years now, okay. next year in March. And the book is still selling in 27 languages. And just in Spanish alone, it sold 3 million copies. So if the stages are not correct, then why are people still buying the book? It doesn't make sense. You know, the book is very loved by the average person on the street, even while the academics love to, you know, cut it down and say there's seven stages, there's nine stages, what have you. So next year, uh, we're playing different anniversaries, different celebrations, and very excited because uh, through a chance meeting six weeks ago, I bumped into the Dean of Palliative Care of Stanford. They're very interested in taking all my mother's paperwork, all her archives, and building a library at Stanford University. Okay. So we just had this discussion two hours ago. I think it's going to happen. So one way we're going to celebrate it is by building this library at Stanford. And then we're going to have different celebrations. We're going to have a new edition of the book. We're also working on a feature movie on my mother's life. We have uh, actress Melina Kanakaridis has written this beautiful script. We've got the whole thing. We've got the producer. We've got the director. We've got financing. We're just shopping for the actress right now. And we're hoping to get the movie made next year, possibly. Tell us a little bit more about about Elizabeth. How was she in real life? You know, I've I've, I've seen some YouTube videos, but I'm very curious to, to know. You know, was she, was she just like she was appearing on the screen? She was basically a Swiss hillbilly. You know, she was a country doctor when she started. She was in charge of a couple of villages in Switzerland, and she'd ride her motorbike from village to village, and she'd you know help farmers. She'd help them deliver like baby cows. You know, so she's a real honest to God Swiss well, hillbilly. But then she came to America and was kind of shocked at the culture here. But, you know, she always re retained that kind of sense of being a little bit of a Swiss hillbilly, you know. She was a workaholic, you know. In 25 years, she wrote 23 books. She wrote over 100 chapters in books. She was a doctor, lectured around the world. She did these workshops, vet projects, AIDS projects, answered unbelievable amount of mail. She also had a full farm, working farm. You know, she was a mother. She saw patients. The woman was like nonstop. But she was so very like calm and understated at the same time, which I never understood how a single person could do that much in a space of like 25 years. Fairly low key, calm, and, and she couldn't sit still. You know, if she was not working, she was either cooking, she was knitting socks that she would auction at the workshops to help underprivileged patients get into the workshops. She was very calm and simple and kind but also as kind of hardcore workaholic, this kind of Swiss work ethic. This, I've read her biography, and this is what the, the, the energy that she was portraying, this, this, this person who could do so many things. One of the things is that, that always interests me, why this subject? What, why this subject of death and dying? You know, what makes her write this book? Uh, well, my mom had a very interesting childhood. She was exposed to death a number of times. She almost died when she was five or six years old. She... Um, was in the hospital for, I think, five or six weeks, just kind of clinging on to life. She had another girl sitting next to her, and they were they kind of had a glass partition between them. One night, this girl came up to the glass, and she couldn't, you know, they couldn't hear the words, but she kind of mouthed words, don't worry about me, I'm going to see the angels, but you're going to be fine. And the next morning, my mother woke up, and the little girl was gone, the bed was made, the staff never discussed her, no one ever talked about her again. And so that was my mother's early experience with the denial of death. Where did the girl go? Why doesn't anyone talk about her? You know, what did she mean? I'm going to go see the angels, you know, and she had died that night. And then uh, she had a neighbor who fell out of a tree and he lay at home dying and he wanted to say goodbye to the village. So everyone came by to say goodbye. And when my mother was only about seven years old, she actually went up to the farmer and said, what is it like to die? You know, so my mother had this early fascination with death. And then after World War II, the day after the war ended, you know, she's in Switzerland. I mean, the war is right there next door. And she joined a peace group and she went and rebuilt villages for two years and helped people and became a nurse, even though she didn't have a specific training. You know, she kind of learned on the road and she spent two years traveling around Europe trying to help rebuild villages and heal people. And she ended up in Poland, and she eventually went to the concentration camps. And it really just fascinated her how, you know, people could murder hundreds of thousands of children and yet be worried because their boy at home has a cold. You know, it didn't make sense to her. It really inspired her thinking about life and death and what's the meaning of this and, and what can we do to make humanity a better place to live. Hmm. So she was always kind of fighting for the underdog. So what about you now? And so now you're the president of this foundation. Do you do yourself some work? 
with deaf and dying? Are you involved in more of yourself, like personally? Uh, you know, I'm a civilian. I'm a photographer. Mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor, a physician, a psychiatrist. But I, I think to some degree I'm an authority on my mother and her work and her intentions. Mm -hmm. And we have this beautiful collection of my mom's work. We have, you know, file cabinets. I have tapes, audio tapes, videotapes. And so we're looking to use this material to build, you know, educational models mm -hmm. to help continue the conversation, which unfortunately 50 years later is still problematic. I mean, it's not like everyone's comfortable with death and dying. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it here if it was no big deal, right? We have a lot of people contact us from around the world and they say we're inspired by your mother's work. You know, how can we continue it? I read your mother's book. I want to start a hospice. How do I do it? You know, my son just died and I'm suicidal. Can you please help me? What would your mother say? All sorts of questions around end of life, palliative care, grief, anything related to, you know, the whole death issue. So we're just trying to continue the conversation and continue educational models that kind of further my mother's work and kind of gets us back to the focus of focusing on the patient because nowadays, you know, people are kind of focused on compliance, HIPAA laws, and they kind of forget, they're so busy with that, they kind of forget that the patient is, should be the focus. Yeah. You know, the humanitarian side of just fo focusing on the patient as a person and not just as, you know, one of 23 people you have to see that day. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was the mother's role of focus, that the patient should have a voice and be treated as an individual. So in terms of the, <clears throat> the workshops, what kind of people are these workshops delivered to? Um, who are the target audience in, in, in this? You know, my mother said that people are afraid to die because, you know, they're afraid to live in some ways. You know, mm -hmm. they have all this angst. They've been damaged by life. You know, they've been abused. You know, they never got past certain issues. We have these five-day workshops called Life, Death, and Transition Workshops. And they're for mm -hmm. anyone with any kind of grief issues, people who are dying, people who have had deaths in the family, yeah, and just, you know, hurt by life. I mean, it doesn't have to be death. It okay. could be abuse or whatever. And so they focus on getting to people to vent out and get rid of these things so they can live more fully. You know, the first time that I've, I've heard about El Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was actually in business because uh, I was doing change management. And we use, right. we use change management, in change management, we use Elizabeth uh, Kubler-Ross model, the, the five stages mm -hmm. for this, to explain right. the changes, you know, and it, it, it's, it really intrigued me about that, you know, that we use this, this grief process or this, this, this dying stages really for business model, you know. So right. did you did you have like businesses contacted you like about, about this and, and, and said, well, look, we, we use that or how was it for Here, you? I'm working with an iconic figure and, you know, I get all sorts of requests on a weekly and monthly basis. It's, you know, still after I've been doing this 23 years now, it's just fascinating to see you think you've seen everything and you haven't. Uh, I get requests for, um, we got Japanese cartoon rights. We have people doing uh, musical records like EPs with five songs and each song is based on a stage. Wow. So they want more information how to do the record. You know, people are doing plays, people are doing all sorts of things in popular media. So it's, it's fascinating how the stages, even though you know, academia loves to blast the stages. It's such a part of society today. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you saw in Deadpool 2, there's a mention of my mother on the stages. Oh, really? I haven't, no, seen, I haven't it. seen it yet. <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah. that's, that's the first time she's been mentioned in a Marvel comic, so I'm very impressed with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you, know, you know, your mom's really made it when she's in a Marvel comic. <laughs> so, think, yeah. yeah, you know, this uh, Kubler-Ross change curve, you know, again, shows that, you know, the stages are valid for some. I'm not saying they're valid for everybody, but it's a model to help continue the conversation. And this Kubler-Ross change curve is used, you know, you look online and there's thousands of references to it. And I'm sure that makes some academia crazy because they love to deny the stages at all. But you know, we get called by Microsoft, you know, and some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies in the world are using it as a training tool on how to deal with loss and change. So I think that validates the five stages, but that's my opinion and I'm biased, of course. What do you two think? Do you think the stages are real or valid or how do you feel about them? I won't be offended. Tell me, tell me the truth. I, my, my, uh, I first came across them in the same way as Olivier did, and I didn't know that until just now. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. those days, again, as part of a change model. But I think as we've been doing this show since we started it, just the sort of theme that's coming through is 
it's the whole death thing is it's 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 the end of something so and i think we go through these little deaths along the way so it makes sense that it fits into change and i think the actual stages of grief i i can if i look in, look at my own life i can see where all of those are apparent and i said not just the times of great sort of loss or grief where i had to go through it but even in those small in sort of those life transitions where things aren't going to be the way they used to be and i right. think we can go we go i i think the stages have a lot of validity i think mm -hmm. depending on what you're going through they they might you might be different levels of intensity or and and i think as has been said anyway they might shoot around in order you might go through one of the stages four times another one three times mm -hmm. another one once yeah, exactly but, that's, yeah. that's what my mother said you know yeah. people often quote her and say you know it's not like a graduation exercise you do not have to go through the stages one by one, you can be in three at the same time, you can go back and forth, you can yeah. go through any stages, you know, people constantly misrepresent what she said, which makes me a little crazy. So <clears throat> I'm glad it's you said not that. linear, is it? It's no, not that's, linear. It's, it's, oh, not it's, at all. It's that's an linear. evolving process. Linear. And that was my experience so. as well, you know, as a, in the business world, I was a change manager for, for three years. And this is what I experienced, really, like some people could start straight away in the bargaining stage, but I could see right. Clearly, I could see that happening. I could see, and some people get to acceptance immediately because, well, this is how they are. But really, right. this is to me. These stages are really valid to me. It's it's great mm -hmm. that you mentioned they are not linear. It's not it's not what the case because we are much more complex, I guess, as 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 human beings. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned something about this talk. You know, starting a conversation about death and dying, and and I recognize that Elizabeth was a pioneer at, at her time. You know, it was at the very beginning. Now, but now we are. Like, as you said, 50 years after this book, you know, so where are we now with this conversation? Do you see this deaf subject of deaf topic? Obviously, we are part of it with Keith and I, you know, we, we try to make this more popular. But still, I, right. I can tell you, we don't have like one million subscribers, <laughs> just like some video gamers, you know, like that just put their <laughs> video games online. It's far from being that popular. So... Where right. are we to well, hear from you? Yeah. I, I think we've certainly made a lot of progress. There's, you know, a lot of amazing things that have come in the last 50 years. Uh, hospice has become accepted in certain parts of the Western world. But, you know, it's also shockingly backwards still after 50 years. I, you know, I just can't imagine. I, I get these calls and they're like, you know, our country doesn't have hospice. I'm like, well, how is that possible in the 21st century, you know? And, and some places it's even illegal to use the word hospice. Okay. I mean... How can this be? I mean, it's crazy. You know, so our group down in Chile, we have a Kubler-Ross group that started last year in Chile. They're starting the very first pediatric hospice in the country. And, you know, it, I'm happy for that. But I'm also sad that after 50 years, there's not a single hospice for children. You imagine the way children die in this country and all around the world. They, they don't have pain control. They don't have any counseling. It's, it's just shocking what goes on. So the change still happens, but it, it's just so slow. It, it's just astounding. Mm -hmm. And we got a call from Norway a couple of years back. They had one palliative care unit, apparently, when I got this call. And I'm like, well, Norway, Norway should be one of the most progressive countries in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Scandinavia. You just think they must really have their, you know, whole system together. And that's not the case, unfortunately. But on a brighter note, uh, we had a group in Holland, and they actually closed recently because they said, we've done it all. You know, success. <laughs> Your mother started the first hospice in the country, and now there's over 200. They don't need us. You know, the, it's here. It's happened. And so this is the first case where I've seen a country really, like, get to, like, you know, a really successful level where they have grief workers, they have palliative care. You know, it's, it's accessible by the population. It's talked about. It's not hidden behind closed doors anymore. So there are some successes in some countries. We've got great grief workers in this country. Uh, but the thing I find is that it's somewhat politicized. Certain people want to be the next Kubler-Ross. So unfortunately, they find the only way to do that is to bash her work. Instead of saying, well, you know, it's a wonderful part of the conversation. I don't agree with it. I don't understand why it seems to be so competitive, at least in this country. I don't know in your your countries how it is, but it seems there's almost competition for who's right instead of, you know, just trying to be a voice in this beautiful chorus talking about death and dying. I mean, there's room for different views, but unfortunately, some people say, you know, is my view is the correct view 
And I think that's harmful to the industry and, and harmful to society. That's a, I think that's a, a bit of a world condition at the moment. I think social media has contributed to that a lot as well. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the subject is. It's, it's so much about who's right, who's wrong. And right. we're, not having, we're not having the conversation. Yeah, yeah so I that, think that's, that's really yeah. a bad way to have the conversation is to bash others. And, and you know, the model of the five stages, I think, is great for some people. And it doesn't apply to other people. But it doesn't make it wrong just because some people don't experience it. The book is sold, you know, millions of copies. People call me and said, you know, I was suicidal. I read the book. It saved my life because I had nowhere to go turn to. So, you know, that's a success. My mother would say, you know, it's just one model. I I'm not saying this is right for everybody, but I want to contribute to the conversation. I want people to talk about it. I want people to listen to patients. I think it's a beautiful voice in the conversation and there's room for other views. And, you know, we should all just get along. <laughs> in your, your view, Ken, just in terms of obviously your upbringing, your background, what is it, what is it do you think is, is the real thing behind the, if you like, the, the modern age is sort of denial of death? Now, it's there. It's in movies. It's in video games. You know, mm -hmm. it's in it's all different forms of media. So yeah. it's not that it's not there. But it's, it's the, do you feel that there is a deeper denial of it and and... What's the driver behind that? There's definitely a denial of it. It's kind of hard to describe, but I see it kind of on these multiple planes. I mean, certain parts of society are beginning to talk about it like you two. You know, this is great having this program. And there's the death cafe and death over dinner. Yeah. And you hear about death doulas. And it's definitely yeah. jumped in the last couple of years. has been another big leap in society. And that's fantastic because those kind of things, you know, bring it to real people, not academia not the medical people, but it brings it to, you know, people on the street, which is needed, but it's going to take a lot more. You know, we got to stop politicizing it. I think, you know, it's, it's, there's still, you know, we're trying to market the movie, for example, all these directors and producers say, oh, we can't do a movie on death. It's not going to sell. But I'm like, well, it's death in half the movies you see. It doesn't make sense. You know, what you see does not make sense. It's really, you are afraid to talk about death. It's not that it yeah. won't sell because the movie's not about death. It's about my mother's pioneering exploits and how she challenged the medical society. You know, it's this woman, you know, woman empowerment. But all they hear is the D word and they shut down. Oh, no, we don't want to do a movie about death. You know? But it's such a bizarre response. Yeah. As you said, it's no. like every every movie every about movie. death or sex. Yeah, you know, that's, a, that's a, it. It's a strange Almost. dichotomy. Like how, you know, you talk about it, you don't want to talk about it, and yet you want to show it, but you can't talk about it because you can't face it. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, I can't, you know, it's like we've moved forward and yet we've moved, we haven't moved forward. I don't get it. It's, yeah. This is like this crazy thing. I, I can't even describe it, but, you know, I see it all the time, but <laughs> I can't rationalize it because it doesn't make sense. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Again, please support the show by signing up at deathhangout.com or clicking on the subscribe button on your screen.